Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation now with Governor Lamont. Governor, you were here right after you gave your budget address uh, early in the legislative session. Here we are with only a couple weeks left. What are your impressions of what's happened so far? I think we passed a pretty good budget last year. It was uh, very bipartisan. It's still in balance, unlike a fair number of our neighboring states. I feel good about that. So I think we're going to stick pretty much to the parameters of the budget we did last time. Makes historic investments in education, K through 12, as well as higher ed and daycare and child care and not-for-profits. I think we'll get to the finish line on time with an honestly balanced budget. I know you, uh, when you were here, you talked about maybe shifting some money from some K-12 to needs to some uh, early childhood education needs. Uh, the Speaker of the House came out this week and said, the budget's going to stay. We're not going to move things around. Do you, do you, are you upset about that? Was no. that an important need? Hey, look, as long as we keep within the contours of an honestly balanced budget, I'm fine. You're right. I wanted to put a little more money into um, early uh, daycare. I thought that made some sense. But the legislature said, let's keep more in the K through 12. That's what we're going to do. All right. And uh, the, the Speaker of the House came out and said that there's about $300 million or so that they need to track down. You know, listen, I look for money under the couch cushion, so that sounds a little bananas to me, but he says it, it's no problem. It's going to be fine. Do you agree? It's a little simple. Um, there's no $300 million sitting in a shoebox somewhere unspent. There's ARPA, which is the federal money, which has been allocated to other priorities. But we're going back to legislation that says maybe this $300 million, $200 million, you could allocate somewhere that's a higher priority for you. And that's what we're discussing with the leadership right now. Is that something that uh, it has to be, you know, really hammered out by the end of the session? Or when you're using reallocated money, it's something that you can kind of do as you go? We're going to do all that before May 7th. And will people have heard about projects and now they're not going to happen because that money is reallocated? What kind of stuff are we talking about? It, it can, it's a whole variety of different um, small ball issue um, items that were going to go into the ARPA, the federal money. I think that'll be redirected probably a little more towards higher ed, a little more to the not-for-profits. That was one of the big things you and I talked about when you were last here was the higher ed uh, talking about needing more money in their budgets. And, and there's been uh, the, the, the teachers unions from higher education. There's been other things saying that, that this has to happen. And now we're not changing the budget. So are there going to be people left in the lurch because of that? Uh, no, because of this federal money, the last of the federal money that really has to all be committed by the end of this year, my hunch is the speaker would like some of that to go in addition to for the higher ed. And I think some of it will go there. All right. One of the things we also talked about, and it's been such a hot button issue, and I know you support these fiscal guardrails. And the idea is that there's limits on what the state can do, and they must stay within those limits. And, and you say it makes fiscal sense to stay with it. We've heard a lot of people criticize them and say, there are valuable programs out there, and because of the fiscal guardrails, whether we like it or not, we can't fund them. What's your response? Have you continued to hear that throughout the session? I think a lot of them forget what it was like uh, 10 years ago when we lurched from deficit to deficit and kept increasing taxes and cutting our money for education, municipal aid. Last six years, we've had um, balanced budgets each time and continue to increase our commitments to education and child care. This budget continues that uh, progress. But with those guardrails, might there be programs that sound great but can't be funded, that simply just can't happen? Uh, the guardrails are essentially an honestly balanced budget that really isn't budget. Two, you know, the budget I inherited, everybody was really happy at the 2017 budget they had done previously. It came in five months past due and was $2 billion out of whack. We we're looking at $2 billion deficits as far as the eye can see. Now we're having a little bit of a back and forth about how much to increase child care. It's a very different place. And certainly some of the criticism of these have come from within your own party where people want to spend money on some programs. The Speaker of the House uh, told CT News Junkie this week that uh, they become an issue because you can't do the things you want to do. And he says, if you want your legacy to be that you were so strident in your views, so unwilling to negotiate and compromise that you ruined it, I don't think that's any better. Is that a concern that, that if you're so fixed to the guardrails, they might just have to, the, the legislature might not support them in the future? The guardrails are just an honestly balanced budget. You can't spend more than you have revenues coming in. You can't spend more than income is going up. It served us very well. We've been able to increase funding for all these core priorities for the last uh, six years in a row. Compare that to the previous six years. All right. Let's talk about some of your legislative priorities. What are you hoping, beyond not talking budget stuff, but other bills, what do you hope to see get through the legislature before May 7th? Look, the biggest commitments we make are following all what we did last year. That is um, housing 
That's everything from workforce housing, affordable housing, rebuilding our downtowns, making sure that Connecticut's a place where young people can afford to start a family. Every business I talk to says, uh, will there be the workforce and will there be a place for them to live? And I'm looking at the AI, the artificial intelligence bill, pretty carefully as well. Let's talk about the housing. Uh, Dan Har is a frequent guest on this show from our partners at CT Insider. Wrote a, uh, an, a column this week saying that if housing gets through, it's going to be a very watered down bill. Uh, let much more water down than he anticipated at the beginning of the session. Are you just feeling like you're not getting where you want to go, or is any incremental step better than nothing? Incremental step. We're making the biggest investment in housing in the history of the state, almost double what we had done previously. That was done in the last budget. It's uh, six, seven hundred million dollars across the board. Um, if businesses say there's no place for my young people to live, they're going to start going elsewhere. Economic growth means economic opportunity for everybody, and housing is a key piece of that. Not to mention, people deserve a roof over their head. You talked about AI. What is it that you're worrying about, or not worrying about, but watching in that bill? Uh, there's a there's a bill circulating through right now. I worry that. Um, I don't want to do anything that stifles innovation. AI is something so new that I want to make sure the next generation of a Facebook or Google related to AI is going to be started in Connecticut, not somewhere else. I think we're going to get that right. Some of the other high-profile bills, I just want to ask you for your take on them. Tipped minimum wage, that's still out there. Uh, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think we're going to reach some sort of a compromise. As you know, we have a minimum wage of 1569, but if you're a tip worker, you don't you have a very lower minimum wage. Most of those tip workers are earning more with uh, their tips. I think we'll find a good balance there that keeps the restaurants happy. Because that's part of it is the, the restaurants are saying, hey, we're business owners, the, some of the uh, servers relying on tips. It, it's it's a fluid situation depending on where you look, I suppose, right? Yeah, the restaurants went through a pretty tough time during COVID. We had to work hard to keep them going. Uh, but we're going to find a good compromise there. I'm not worried about that. I mentioned them earlier, so I'll give them some love. Can I get rail commuters? I talked about them on Twitter, but uh, there's been a lot of talk about the reductions to Shoreline East. Is there any uh, lifeline uh, to that service? I know a lot of the Shoreline legislators have said they'd like to see that back. It's just very expensive. The taxpayers subsidize it at about $150 per seat. Uh, a lot fewer people going on Shoreline East than there was even, um, you know, way before COVID, the numbers started going down. If they build a little more housing in around those train stations, there'll be more demand. That said, Metro North is going, the Waterbury Line is going. They're almost all back to normal, except on Fridays. Not as many people commute on Fridays. <laughs> well, let's, let's not tell anybody that. That sounds good for the employees. On the Shoreline East, though, is a little bit of chicken and egg because uh, you've said, and we've talked about this, there's just not the butts in the seats to ju justify it. But then the supporters of the rail say, well, there's not enough routes. There's not enough times that you can get on the train to make it worthwhile for people to put their butts in the seats. So is it we a little chicken We had a lot more egg? frequent rail service than Shoreline East, and people still weren't taking it. Maybe it's um, the new bridge that was built and makes it easier. We're looking at it hard. If there's demand, we're definitely going to increase uh, capacity there. How about climate change? I know uh, the, your administration has backed off the whole EV, uh, some say mandate. I know you'll tell me it wasn't a mandate, but that whole idea you backed off of, is there going to be something for climate change that gets done? We just did an event where we're putting solar panels on more and more of our schools. What that means is uh, these schools are off the grid, saves them a lot of electricity, not creating any emissions, and they can uh, plug their um, EV buses right into the solar at night so it doesn't put any demand on electric use. Another bill uh, dealing with driving uh, is the .05 bill uh, lowering the drunk driving threshold. We had uh, Commissioner Eucalito on a couple of weeks ago and he talked about that being an important priority of his department, but also those uh, wrong way ramp sensors. And we just this past week saw another vehicle in driving rain uh, get alerted by those sensors, turn around and go the other way. They seem to be working. We've seen them work in other states. Let's start with the .05. Is that a big priority for you? I think the wrong way driving is related to distracted driving. It's really picked up a lot. I don't know whether reducing it to 0.05 like Utah will make a difference. I also think it's social media. I think uh, there are a variety of distractions that are making it dangerous out there on the roads. I do worry about that. All right. Um, I want to talk about a couple of things that are not legislative related. Uh, you talked this week about the news about Sikorsky potential layoffs. We don't have an exact number. Some reports are talking in the 400 range. Of course, this related to that Army helicopter contract. Is that a big blow for the state? Uh, they didn't get the scout. The Army uh, decided not to go forward with that. They had about 400 engineers who are in the design phase of that. Can I tell you something, Eric? 
We need a lot of engineers in this state. Uh, everybody from Electric Boat to elsewhere in Sikorsky, we'll find places for those guys very soon. Because that's been a big priority is to get the training programs for the younger folks. So is that maybe the focus here is to just shift some people to a different slot, different spot? Make sure that those 400 people stay in Connecticut and don't go elsewhere and we find them jobs because a lot of people need their skills. All right. And the last thing I wanted to ask you about, the National Insurance Crime Bureau put out some new numbers from 22, from 2022 to 2023. Car theft in Connecticut went up 33 percent. That was the third highest increase in the country. I know you'll tout some of the violent crime numbers being down, but people say some of these nuisance crimes are what gets attention and what irritates people. Is there something to be done? Are you surprised by those numbers or does something have to be done about that? Some has to be done, but I'll start with your premise. You know, we have one of the lowest crime states in the country, and I'm really proud of that. We have great police. We probably need more police, more policing. Don't leave your fob in the car, just a little heads up there. And uh, I think with a GPS and the such, we'll be able to track these cars a lot better and stop them dead in their tracks. All right, we just have a couple seconds left. Anything big you're going to be watching between now and May 7th? Your show. Oh, excellent answer. <laughs> but any big legislative priority people should be... This, this is a big one that they should be watching for, just kind of see how I think how it it's a up. shorter session. I want to deliver the goods and everything we promised last year, and that's housing. That's the transportation infrastructure. That's expansion of daycare. It's a really good budget. Let's get the job done together. Well, and like we said, 600 bills still out there, so a lot could happen between now and then. We'll be following it. We appreciate you being here talking about it, and we look forward to having you back again. Thanks, Eric. All right, Governor Lamont, thank you.